Let's quickly give you an update on the a very big story we are covering for you broke out in the early hours of this morning. Police and Interpol arresting Israel's most wanted fugitive in Johannesburg in the area of Bryanston. Andy Mashiale is the Interpol ambassador and security advisor and he joins us now on the line. Uh, Mr. Mashiale, thank you very much for your time. In the early hours of the morning, a joint operation between Interpol and Israeli intelligence ended with officers from the SAPS storming a house in Bryanston, north of Johannesburg. Inside, there were eight suspects apprehended, including one fugitive, Yaniv Ben Simon. Ben Simon is described as Israel's most wanted man and also an alleged enforcer of a jailed mobster, Yitzhak Ebajil. Our intelligence led us to this house that you see behind us and in the house we managed to find seven Israeli citizens where we also find a lot of firearms rifles. Now Interpol had a red notice on Ben Simon, a request to law enforcement worldwide to seize and arrest him on site for conspiracy to commit murder and attempted murder since 2015. He is accused of two attempted mob hits in 2003 and 2004 which wounded five people while working for Eber Jill's crime organization. It's reported that Ben Simon might have been hiding in South Africa for 15 years before he was caught. I'm not going to go into the operational details, but uh, as you can see, Koli NSC, you know, which is in the public knowledge, this gentleman has been on the Interpol's red notice since 2015. So basically what this then means um, would be that Israel has sent a notice to the South African police through their Interpol Bureau of the site, uh, engaging with the Pretoria National Bureau, the National uh, Crime Bureau of Interpol. And they would then engage uh, um, intelligence, tactics, strategies, and other organizations which have to do with uh, collecting of information leading to the death of uh, the bad guys that are wanted all over the world to have found and new South Africa as a haven. The dominoes have started falling and many more dominoes are going. Now, Ebajil, as the leader of the crime family, was given three life sentences at an Israeli court for drug trafficking and murder. You see, the mob organization ran a major ecstasy smuggling operation in the U.S. They also exploded a car bomb in Tel Aviv in 2003, killing three innocent bystanders in a botched attempt at killing a rival Israeli ecstasy kingpin, Z.F. Rosenstein. You see, Ebajil was extradited to America in 2011 over the murder of an Israeli ecstasy dealer who had stolen one of their shipments. But he was returned to Israel three years later to serve the rest of his sentence and stand trial on further charges. You see, Ebajil did not shy away from violence at all. He even obtained an anti-tank rocket that he was going to use on his rivals. And he was known to fund all these activities by trading in dope. When it comes down to it though, in my opinion, I think in a lot of others, there are two Israeli crime families that really rise above the rest. And that's the Abergils, who I've mentioned a bunch, and the Rosenstein family. And I could do an entire episode just on the Abergils because Yitzhak, the leader, like I said, criminal prodigy, the likes of which I've rarely seen. He's the son of Moroccan immigrant parents, and he grows up the youngest of 10 siblings in the rough city of Lod, in the projects in the 70s. And this is a lot from, from Ben's own reporting. His father was an alcoholic, and his mother worked a bunch of jobs that was never home. He had older brothers that were in and out of prison and addicted to drugs. This is a quote he told the court, I can remember that we were always lacking. If Abergil is to be believed, his gangsterdom started at literally three years old, because honestly, who remembers being three, when he started shoplifting and stealing food. He was allegedly hiding guns, drugs, and like grenades for dealers and gangsters when he was five or six years old. He said he would use shapes and stuff to identify whose guns was whose when he hid them. That was his system. At 12, he graduated to running a stash house selling hash and heroin with his brother. And at 14, he was smuggling drugs to the jail for one of his other brothers. 14 is also when he shot someone for the first time, a 33-year-old who wouldn't let him into like a rec center or something like that, some sort of teen party because he was wearing shorts. And look, I'm not condoning violence or saying bouncers sometimes deserve to get shot, but also sometimes bouncers deserve to get shot. 
Now during the raid in Bryanston, when the enforcer Ben Simon was named, police found an arsenal of weapons including automatic rifles, pistols, cash, stolen motorbikes, a signal jamming device, drones fitted with cameras and 3 kilos of meth. And on top of that, a torture van, which was a soundproofed delivery truck with a chair bolted to the floor. Due to strict security measures, the media is not allowed to attend this case in court. For the second time in under a week, the media has been prohibited from covering the court case of a suspected Israeli gang. Last Thursday, Interpol South Africa and several other law enforcement agencies conducted a raid at a Bernstein property where they arrested eight men. One of those eight men is one of Israel's most wanted fugitives, who is also on the Interpol's red list. The Israeli fugitive made his first court appearance for extradition purposes at the Randberg Magistrate Court last Friday in an in-camera session where the media was also not allowed. Today, eight men, including the Israeli fugitive, made their first appearances at the Randberg Magistrate Court in an in-camera session. They faced charges of possession of unregistered firearms, ammunition, and contravening the Electronic Communications Act of South Africa. As we remember that during the raid in Bryanston last week, police did find guns, drugs, car signal jammers, hard currency, and other illicit items. So far, the identities of the men remain a secret. However, we do know that there was a request for a Hebrew interpreter, which does indicate that some, if not all of the men, are Israeli nationals. So far, the NPA says it is only pursuing extradition for only one of the accused, which is the Israeli fugitive. However, the NPA does say that before he is extradited back to Israel, he will first have to face a trial in South Africa for the crimes he is allegedly committed. Gilberto dos Santos, also known as Fominho, is a notorious Brazilian drug lord and one of the leaders of the PCC criminal organization. He is considered one of the most dangerous and influential crime bosses in Brazil. You see, the arrest of Fominho happened in Mozambique in 2020. He was tracked to his base in Johannesburg, where he was living under the alias Luis Gomez de Jesus. You see, the arrest of Gilberto provides further proof of the growing links between South American, South African and East African crime groups. You see, Dos Santos is accused of controlling large-scale shipments of cocaine and weapons from Bolivia and Paraguay to Brazil, as well as running an expensive criminal network in Bolivia, which benefits from police protection. PCC is an organized crime gang whose reach has spread across the regions of South America. It emerged in the early 90s during a prison uprising in Sao Paulo state. Now, three decades later, it has grown to become South America's most powerful criminal organization, having expanded to more than 30,000 baptized members. The PCC's reach now extends throughout virtually all of South America. The PCC uh, is responsible for some of the most violent terror attacks that Brazil has ever seen. Based in Sao Paulo and with over 30,000 members, this violent organization have massacred police, murdered judges and shut down entire cities. They control 60% of Brazil's cocaine market and are responsible for the biggest bank robberies in the country's history. The PCC is the strongest, most sophisticated, and most dangerous criminal organization you haven't heard of. The PCC discovered a market niche that wasn't being utilized by the Mexicans or the Colombians. The main consumer market for both is the United States. Now the European route became secondary and the PCC discovered that. Foreign drug gangs would go into different Latin American countries to acquire the drugs, but they didn't have the necessary logistics to transport the cocaine to Europe. Now that vacuum the PCC exploited to become the biggest and most influential criminal organization in South America. Dos Santos's arrest in Mozambique brought a 21-year manhunt to an end. He was apprehended with two Nigerian associates at a luxury hotel in Maputo in a joint operation between the US DEA and the Mozambique police and the Brazilian federal police. Dos Santos had long maintained a presence in Mozambique and South Africa since both countries were destinations for his shipments. Sabian gangsters, including battle-hardened veterans from the Yugoslav wars, 
also ended up settling in Johannesburg. According to a report, there were at least nine murders and two assassination attempts in the Johannesburg area involving Serbians with backgrounds in organized crime or paramilitary organizations between 2018 and 2020. The report said Balkan gangs have been attracted to South Africa because it's a key transit point in the global cocaine trade, a business in which these gangs are increasingly involved in. You see, South Africa serves as a transit point for the drug trafficking networks, particularly those moving drugs between South America and Europe. You see, these syndicates may use South African ports, airports or border crossings to move drugs across the continent. Many of the slain Sabians were associates of Dobrosav Gavridge. You see, Gavridge was an ex-cop turned hitman who assassinated a warlord, Akan, in a Belgrade hotel lobby in 2000. He then fled to South Africa in 2006 before getting involved in the local underworld. Gavridge lived in Johannesburg under the new identity of Sasa Kovacevic until 2011 when he was wounded in a hit on a Cape Town gang boss. He's been fighting extradition to Serbia where a 35-year sentence is waiting for him. Another one is Milan Miki Jurisic, a co-accused along with Gavridge for Akan's murder. He was shot dead in Johannesburg in 2018 where he had been hiding with the help of a Belgian passport. Now three months later, one of his associates, Darko Kulic, a member of the Serbian guard paramilitary group, was himself gunned down in Randberg. Now also in 2019, Another friend of Gavridge was gunned down by masked men with assault rifles. <laughs> I'm telling you, these guys are playing Wild West games here in South Africa, man. The police action is aimed at mafia bosses who grew rich on the battlefields of Croatia and Bosnia. In recent years, they've turned on each other. Amid the murders and massacres, other, darker crimes came to light. This badly decayed body is all that remains of one of Slobodan Milosevic's oldest friends, Ivan Stambolic, a former Yugoslav president. Mafia killers kept Stambolic waiting at the graveside while they dug a bigger hole and then shot him in the head. In March this year, the government decided to act. Every state has its mafia. The problem here, though, is that the mafia wanted their own state. We could not allow Serbia to become a kind of European Colombia. The Gordian mob had to be But the gangsters struck first. Prime Minister Zoran Djindjic, the man everyone hoped would transform Serbia, was shot dead, killing the hopes of millions of Serbs and of Western governments. Mourners flooded the streets of Belgrade to remember their fallen leader, a man who promised to beat the Mafia and send its leaders to the Hague on war crimes charges. All the signs suggest that Djindjic's murder on Wednesday, March the 12th, was an inside job. As the Prime Minister drove towards Parliament, three gunmen gained access to a nearby building. Zoran Djindjic, on crutches after a football injury, was an easy target. His head of security was off work. Someone had turned off the CCTV cameras. As Djindjic stepped out of his car, a bullet pierced his heart, a symbol of how deeply the Mafia had penetrated Serbian life. Fugitive drug trafficker Tony Yester was based in South Africa be found to translate Brazilian court documents into English. <laughs> now Tony Yester remained in South Africa until his arrest in Rome and then extradited to the United States where he pled guilty to running a marijuana ring in Florida. While on the run he appeared in a documentary film Operation Odessa. Yes, yes. I saw this documentary. It was so so dope. That's when I first heard of Tony Yester. You see, this documentary, he was recounting his role in an outrageous plot to sell a Russian naval submarine to the Kali cartel, but he eventually screwed them over and went into hiding. I think that's where he came to South Africa to come hide from all of these people. And eventually he said, look, all my enemies are dead and I don't give a fuck about them. I'm going to see them when I get to hell. When I saw that, I was like, yeah, this guy, 
Have it's you ever seen Operation Odessa? What, that was a documentary on, on, on Netflix? Netflix. I feel like I did start that. Dude. Really? It's amazing. It's amazing. And then in it, there's this one guy. They're drug smugglers. This one guy wants to get a submarine, and uh, he's talking to the guy selling them the submarine. And the yeah, guy, yeah. Sa- and the guy yeah. says, uh, do you need nukes? He he like he offers them nuclear missiles yeah. to go with the submarine. Do you want chips with that? Like that? <laughs> Do you want yeah. guacamole? Yeah. It's hard to talk to those people and this and that. And he's coming out. He says, you know what's happening? You cannot fucking believe. They offering me fucking nuclear weapon. Can you sell nuclear weapon? I said, fuck you. I say, are you mad? I say, man, you know, keep his fucking Keep yourself together. We're looking for a fucking submarine. We don't want no fucking bombs. He turned around and said, think about it. Fuck, he went back into the sauna. I just want to run away from there. I say, shit, man, you know what I mean? What the fuck I'm involved with? I said, I'm going to fucking get the electric chair out of this shit. Do they ever stop looking for $10 million? I have to tell you, all my enemies are dead and I'm happy. I'm going to.